Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, it's 4.30, we're going to go ahead and get started. As you all know, uh, Cesar Arias uh, is on sabbatical and might actually even be doing some work. Uh, so I'm Sam Shelburne and uh, I'm going to um, introduce our, our speaker today. Uh, this is part of the MyCog Antimicrobial Resistance uh, Seminar Series. It's part of the um, Center for Antimicrobial Resistance and Microbial Genomics. And we're, we're really fortunate today uh, to have Kevin Geary uh, joining us. Kevin is a, a professor uh, at the uh, University of Houston, and he has trained uh, legions of uh, pharmacists uh, that we are fortunate to have working throughout the medical center and throughout the U.S. in terms of uh, antimicrobial use. And so we're really fortunate to have him here today, and he's an expert in Clostridium difficile, and he's going to be talking to us uh, about relationships between Clostridium difficile and antibiotic use. So, Kevin. Not about antimicrobial Right, sorry. This, I should say that's the advertisement for next, the next seminar. Perfect, Sam couldn't say it better myself. Okay, this is what I'm gonna talk about. What antibiotics uh, cause C. diff is today's topic, so hopefully, thanks for all co for coming. Uh, thank you, Susan, for organizing this, you're fantastic. And um, thanks to uh, the, the expert panel who are slowly arriving, three quarters of you guys are already here, so hopefully the rest of the crew shows up in a few minutes. All right, so today I discussed the relationship between how the microbiome works and how disruption to that microbiome leads to C. diff. Uh, from there, that should make it kind of a lot easier to understand the relationship between antibiotic use and, and C. diff. And then finish off with a small section of what the new world will look like when dysbiosis becomes the, the new rage. So I think. I think I know a lot of you guys here. Thanks for all for coming, by the way. But to get everybody up to speed in terms of C. diff, a few slides in terms of pathogenesis, a couple on treatment, and then we'll dive right into antibiotic risk factors. Uh, so this is Rob Britton, who many of you know over at Baylor. Uh, this right here is the focus of today's talk. This is the Mona Lisa. Look at that beautiful smile. You can see it. This is what our poop looks like. Uh, before you expose it to antibiotics. This is, this is normal microbiota. And we have some of the world's best antibiotic stewardship pharmacists and physicians in the world that are going to come talk to us in a few minutes. And you know the Mona Lisa goes away quite quickly after we start using high-risk antibiotics in the hospital. And then you can see very sad, now we have a very susceptible microbiota. And, and we're gonna, this is the, the focus of the talk today will be here. But so what this allows to happen is C. diff spores, which are ubiquitous in the environment, this allows them to germinate, uh, turn into the vegetative C. diff cells, start producing toxin, and then you get that characteristic C. diff infection. Unless you mount an antibody response, and if you do, then you can actually clear that and you're all set. Now, we generally what we do, once you have C. diff infection, is treat with metronidazole or vancomycin, usually effective at stopping the diarrhea, but for about a quarter of them, because we continue to disrupt that microbiota, with the antibiotics we're using, you get into this chronic cycle of recurrent disease. So much so that people describe this as vancomycin dependence, extremely poor quality of life as you can imagine, and people resort to crazy stuff like infusing poop through their nose, as we all know, fecal microbiota transplantation, to get us back into this normal microbiota. So that's the ABCs of, of C. diff. Many of you are familiar with this, but with this slide, 
you can immediately see areas we can intervene to either prevent it in the first place or ideally and cure it. So either like stop using so much gosh darn antibiotics, focus of today, prevention of germination, which would be research, impact toxin production by killing the bug, stopping the inflammation, and most recently, thanks to Merck, you guys, for getting us a nice antibody. We can infuse some antibodies in there now and take care of it that way. So this is the most highly plagiarized figure in the world of infectious diseases. If you haven't seen this yet, where have you been living? Uh, it's a Canadian, which is totally sweet, Susan Putinin, published in CMAG, available online. And if you look at the fine print, you can even use it without asking permission, which is nice. So, so here is here's C. diff, it's fecal oral. Fecal oral, so if you're eating C. diff, what are you eating? True, this is eating a little poop on the way down. Uh, vegetative cells uh, get killed by the gastric acid, the spores make it through. Uh, that's one of the premises for PPIs. Uh, germinated in the small bowel, and then this is a blow up of the colon, so it's a colonic related disease. Uh, this is the, essentially the battle between good and evil. So here's your vegetative C. diff right here, producing their two toxins, toxins A and B. And it's the, in that interaction with the clonic epithelial cell that causes the damage. And I think I have a blow up here. I don't. And so it's, it's really the IL-8 is the driver of neutrophils into this site of infection. And that's the characteristic pseudomembranous plaques that you see. So if you get the colonoscopy, it's really the fight between good and evil that you're looking at there. And it's not the toxins per se but it's the interaction between the clonic epithelial cells, our own inflammatory response, uh, causing a lot of the damage that we're seeing. Okay, so from there, and especially Rob's cartoon, I think, you can immediately start saying to yourself, so to prevent or treat C. diff, it's correct this dysbiosis, and I will say for today, maybe prevent it in the first place, and then you have to kill the organism, and if you could affect the toxins and spores, that'd be great, and then your adaptive immunity kicks in, and so if you can prevent that. So when you're thinking of treatment algorithms for C. diff, it's not a this or a that or a this, which of these things should I choose from? But it's put these things into their appropriate buckets. What am I doing? Am I trying to correct or, or improve the dysbiosis? Am I obviously killing the bug, which I have to do? And am I helping with the immune system with a vaccine or, or an antibody, for example? So if somebody says, can I give a fecal transplant? Remember, you still have to kill that bug. And so if you're not killing the bug, you, you, that's no good. If I'm killing the bug, but I'm causing dysbiosis, that's not good either. And so as you're, as you're wrapping your mind around how to treat C. diff, you, those three buckets really helps. And then from that theoretical what we have to do, you can start immediately placing into your bucket list of where are my treatment algorithms. And so probiotics and FMT fall firmly into uh, prevention of dysbiosis. Here are the drugs that we normally use and or the, the other stuff that's, that's either here or on the horizon. Congratulations, you guys are now, in five minutes or less, world's experts on treatment and pathogenesis of C. diff. Not why we're here today, but to get everyone grounded, to get them started on it. So this is why we're here today, C. diff and antibiotics. For anybody who was here for the Gut Health Symposium, maybe two or three weeks ago, I'm gonna repeat a couple of slides from there. So if you weren't paying attention, you can get it again, lucky you. If you were paying attention, feel free to snooze for a few minutes. But it's important to get this concept down to move into the antibiotic concept. Okay, so here is our regular way you get C. diff. And I'm going to sort of say that's not exactly correct. Okay, imagine you're sitting in the hospital, uh, you're getting truckloads and truckloads and truckloads of high-risk antibiotics. You fill this room up with antibiotics, you infuse it into a patient, you cause all this dysbiosis. This is how we normally think of C. diff. Uh, we wait a long time because we've got to give these guys lots and lots of antibiotics. And then eventually I walk in the room and I have this nice study going on. But it just, unfortunately for this patient here, I just saw a patient with C. diff and my hand is loaded with C. diff. I say, hello there patient. I see that patient and unfortunately now that person has C. diff. This is our bread and butter infection control way we give people C. diff, right? It's this rare event damn hand of mine gave that person C. diff. And so I'm going to challenge that concept to begin this way. So the question there is exposure to C. diff a rare chance. It's like, oh, how unlucky for you that, that I walked in with my hand loaded up C. diff. Uh, and is it a particular hyper virulent strain that we're really, really worried about and all the other C. diff we couldn't care less about? These are the two things I want to tackle. 
And then I also want to tackle the concept of truckloads, that it's only that person that's been in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks that I'm really, really worried about. I want to tackle those two concepts, and that's going to really help us understand the relationship between antibiotics and C. diff. Okay, here's where I start repeating myself a little bit from two weeks ago, but it's a really, really important study. So this is uh, Mark Wilcox, big C. diff researcher out of England. He controls all of this municipality of Leeds. He controls all the poop that comes into all the hospitals, and then he can do some slick typing, in this case, whole genome sequencing. So this is um, 1,200 cases of C. diff. He does whole genome typing of all of them, and no one really knows how many single nucleotide variants you need in order to say this is exactly the same strain. This should say zero to 10, someday I'll correct this, but they did not, my apologies. So zero would be absolutely identical, 10 would be pretty much exactly the same thing. And then look up here, and wherever you see this gray stuff, whatever you, it's, we've never, ever, ever seen this particular strain before. That's what this is trying to illustrate to us in this whole city that we're collecting stool from. And so what that says then, either up to 80%, or 50% of all strains are completely unique. So that completely erases that hand coming in that I've just come from another patient to give it to you. This would completely contradict that. It's like, whoa, 80% of the time, I've never ever seen this particular strain before. So this, this, this essentially changed a lot of things. So we took that and said, well, a spore is super hardy. It's very, very hard to kill. We know that. We need like caustic amount of bleach in order to get rid of it in the room. And a spore could not care less whether it's inside or outside of a hospital doorway or in a hospital to begin with. And remember, in a hospital, we use tons and tons of bleach to get rid of C. diff spores. While, when's the last time you guys completely bleached down this room or your homes, for example? So why couldn't a spore rolling down the street be everywhere, be ubiquitous? So, so that's what we hypothesized. Bobby Jean, you're awesome. You helped to get a sizable grant from the uh, Texas Department of State Health Services to, to explore that, to go look. Do you want to ask a question? That'd be sweet if you do. Are you just, no, you're just scratching your oh, chin. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. No, don't. Yeah, the good, the deep <laughs> thoughts, I'm loving it. Okay, so we did a large environmental study all around the city of Houston, looking to see where we could find C. diff. And the thought here is, well, the Herman Park, those park benches at Herman Park, when is the last time those were ever cleaned? Those were cleaned the day they were put in and never again. Now, we know we clean our homes, but do we clean our homes more than Burger King and Target and, and McDonald's? Probably not, right? Because they pay people to clean their rooms. So our hypothesis going into this would be park benches, parks are gonna be loaded. Our homes are probably getting intermediate and places where you pay people to clean would probably be somewhat less. So this is, this, this, is, this is the largest ever. Jahangir's in the room, Jahangir alum. Uh, this would be his study, and he, he was super successful doing it. Uh, so we were right. So if you hit Herman Park for a little beer after this, you have a one in four chance of sitting on C. diff. Congratulations. <laughs> and if you go to your home, 20%, and then even 10%, essentially, if you go really anywhere in the world. So this is known. We often say the spores are ubiquitous, but this kind of demonstrates just how ubiquitous it is. If you look down at your shoes right now, uh, Catherine and Kate, one of your four shoes will have C. diff on the bottom of it. I guarantee you. And it's toxigenic and it's identical to what we just saw in the patient in, in the hospital. So this, so this is where essentially in your homes where it is. We say that's essentially what we travel with the most, shoes and what the frequently, most frequently touched areas your homes are, aka your doorsteps. That, that's how we put that together. And then this is what we do in the lab. Essentially, we have this taxi driver service that goes all over the Texas Medical Center collecting clinical isolates. And we periodically do hospital environmental samples. And this is the study that we've done right here. How am I doing? Okay, good. So just line these up. Here's, here's that hypervirulent 027 strain, which just caused a big hospital epidemic. So you can see there is a a ton more of that in the hospital than in the community. Excuse me, sir. Sure. Could you use this mic, please? Oh, my own. Where? Raise it a little bit more. How's that? Oh, man. Choking me to death. Perfect. Okay, good. So then you can line it up, and you see these are exactly the same. There's really no difference of what we get in our shoe bottoms versus what we get see in our, in our patients. 
And this is Sam Aiken, good for him. He then went and looked at a lot of these patients in terms of their severe disease presentation. And so here's our hypervirulent O27, which does cause severe C. diff quite often with bad outcomes. But FP11 doesn't look very good, and 001 doesn't look good, FP24 looks terrible. And so we got to remove this that is just one particular hypervirulent strain. This is ubiquitous spores. Man, this is awesome. You're really, you're really kind of optimized me here, aren't you? This is great. It's all over the place. Okay, so then this is a big change in your mind. So instead of thinking of this rare event that walks in the door, you have to think of C. diff is absolutely everywhere. And so probably every meal you had for breakfast, if it was a leafy green vegetable, lunch, and tonight's dinner, you will be eating C. diff. And once again, remember, if you're eating C. diff, what are you eating? Yes, you are. It's a, it's a big coliform world out there. And this is what we have to remember when we're thinking of antibiotic risk and C. diff. It's not, oh my gosh, I'll give lots of antibiotics and pray they don't get exposed to C. diff. You have to assume they're getting daily exposure to C. diff, and so the risk will happen because of the antibiotic use. You almost remove C. diff from your thought process because it's ubiquitous. And that's a big change in thought process when you're thinking of this. So that, that's ramming home point number one. Okay, so now that, we, that I completely convinced you of all this stuff, we, I want to tackle this. How much antibiotic exposure do you need to be at risk of which antibiotics? Is it really father time? Is it really father time super duper slow before you get C. diff? And so that would be, we'll move forward. Ready to go? I need your help again. It's not coming forward on me. There it is. Okay, so now from there, thank you. That was awesome. I don't know how you did it. So then we switch out of C. diff and now we go to microbiome. So now, now we're going to be living in that. And people often describe it as uh, 10 times more microbial cells in our body than there are human cells. So if you look at us, we're actually more microbiology than we are human. And so that's, that's the, the, the wild world of the microbiome is next. Okay, the, the microbiome has, has opened up a whole new term called systems biology. So, so here's your gut. And in your gut, as we know, are tons and tons of bugs, called uh, microbes obviously. And go turn the wheel this way. And these bugs are producing tons and tons of genes, which produce tons and tons of proteins. And then all of these proteins produce tons and tons of metabolites, which then influence all these microbes. So this is the world of system biology. So all the cool kids in the block, oh, I'm in systems biology now. That's what they're saying when they, when they tell you this. And so depending then what kind of stud you are, if you're, if you're trying to figure out what the gut microbiota looks like, you're doing stuff called 16X sequencing. If you're seeing what genes and proteins are being produced, you're, you're into the world of transcriptomics and proteinomics. And then if you're saying what metabolites these guys are producing, you're, you're doing something called metabolomics. All these words and all these jobs didn't exist five years ago. Uh, go get a PhD and go get your tons of jobs in this particular area, they're cool. And then you, then you hit the mucus layer of our, of our clonic epithelial, and then eventually you get into a word we know, which is called immunology, Whew, we're finally back to being human again. So all of this stuff then put together is called systems biology. And so this is then 16S RNA sequencing. And, and here would be person number one, person number two, person number three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And because there are tens of thousands of species of bacteria in your gut, it's, it's totally impossible to try to keep track of all this stuff. So they squish it all down into phylum because it's at least manageable in terms of your thought process to get through. And so they, they, they put the phylums of what's in there into firmicutes, bacteroides, actinobacteria, and then proteobacteria. So then firmicutes are mostly spores. So remember, spores are hard to kill uh, because of metabolic inactivity. Uh, bacteroidetes is, is actually much easier to remember because that's bifrage, which we're more familiar with plus a whole bunch of other ones, non-spore forming, usually anaerobic, always anaerobic in this case. Actinobacteria, no one really knows what they are, which means they're probably the most important. And proteobacteria is the stuff that we know a lot about. That's, what, that's the pseudomonas, the E. coli, the Klebsiella. So now that you've got that, you can say, okay, so humans in the normal microbiota are usually either firmicutes or bacteroides. 
but everybody's got a little bit of protea bacteria. And don't ever tell an E. coli guy that E. coli is not important because they'll kill you. <laughs> they like are into that. And you, well, it's only like 1% of the microbiome. No, that's the important part. But so you can see this is what we normally look like. And so to, to what we normally look like, then we'll get screwed up when we start giving you antibiotics. And so I stole this slide from Tor Savage. It's super complicated, but totally cool. Because we don't think in phylum. We think in the world of Staph aureus and Pseudomonas and from me C. diff. And to go from phylum to species can sometimes, which one is that? And that's what this is trying to illustrate with there. So start the wheel here. And if you're these green dots, that's your firmicutes, if you now know. If you're these blue dots over here, your, your bacteroides. If you can find a couple of the, the orangey things here, that's proteobacteria, got it? And then you, in this particular st story, we're doing stool, lucky us. And you take the wheel over here, and all these blues mean we have lots of that, and that means lots of firmicutes. Oh, okay, got it. And then keep going till you see some more blues. Okay, here's a lot more blues over here. And if you can see it, that's Bacteroides, what we know, and that's the Bacteroidetes. And so that's the link between phylum and the species stuff that we know. And this is simply illustrating, I'm not lying to you, when I tell you it's Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, which is the phylum that is most important for humans. And this gives you a flavor for what those species look like in terms of the, in, in the phylum. Okay, those hardcore nature genetic slides, we turn now into my own New England Journal of Medicine slide right here. It's hopefully getting published next week sometime. Uh, this would be my cartoon. So now when you're doing research on this stuff, think of this huge diversity of bugs that are in there. And then also they're all happy, but they're all different. And there's a lot of them. So many times when we think of de killing bugs with antibiotics, we just think of decreasing CFU counts. But add to that a shrinking diversity of bugs that are there. So here's our cefepine treated patient, and here is my C. diff bug of the day, and here's uh, somebody else's yeast that's overgrown as well. So think of not only decreased abundance, which we normally think about, but also think of decreased species diversity. And those two things come into play when we better get into this. Okay, then I want to spend a couple of slides illustrating just this sweet ass science that comes out of this stuff. And it's pretty simple. So this is then, you turn this into diversity indexes. So how diverse is your poop in this particular case in terms of the bugs that live there? In this case, down is bad, enough is good, meaning very diverse, not very diverse. And this is just a study out of Chicago looking at recurrent C. diff patients, patients with primary and control. And so you see as you go further and further down the C. diff world, your, your, your microbiome becomes less and less diverse in this period. So it's even better. This is um, Vince Young uh, in uh, Ann Arbor. So here is patients when they're newly diagnosed with C. diff. Another diversity index where down is bad, up is good, and all these little dots represent a person. So you can see lots and lots of persons here have poorly diverse microbiome. And then bring your eyes over to here. This is when they're being treated with metronidazole vancomycin. And you can kind of make your eyes show that, well, lots of these people are actually even going down more, aka we're creating even more dysbiosis when we're treating these patients. But eventually, if you get all better, which is this slide right here, you have to restore that diversity in order to get rid of your C. diff. Okay, that's what this is trying to illustrate. And then last but not least, you could just run some really sweet PCRs and say, how many antibiotic resistant genes are in there? Uh, your, your, your FKS, your CREs, your BREs, NAs, et cetera, et cetera. And so up is bad again, down is good. And here's, here's a, a patient going for an FMT, uh, a bunch of them, of which some of them have tons and tons and tons of antibiotic resistant genes in there. And then they all go away after the FMT. And they actually even look better than the donor does, ironically enough, in this particular case. So just showing the illust illustrating the, really the, the power that the restoration of the microbiome has. Whew. Okay, we're getting close. So now you know C. diff is ubiquitous, and now you've got a pretty good working knowledge of microbiome and then how we can use the microbiome to run studies. So now we can apply most of that knowledge. How does antibiotics that we use change those parameters? So, that, so that's next. Okay, so this is mouse models, and this is a, what a microbiome looks like in a mouse before they are exposed to antibiotics right here. 
Do not bother ever reading down here. It's way too small, except for you two. You can maybe get it. But here's your Bactroidetes. Here's pretty much all your firmicutes along here. And here's your proteobacteria, E. coli, and pseudomonas. So if you go down, that's a bad thing. So here's Cipro. You know, not that much change, though, though you can obviously see changes. Here's Vank, which is pretty much wiping a lot of stuff out. Ampicillin, which causes overgrowth of uh, your proteobacteria. And here's Clinda, your quintessential anti-C drug. Um, so you, this, this is after five days, not very long. And then what this is trying to illustrate is that five days of therapy, five days only, is that enough to cause C. diff colonization? And that's what this is trying to show over here. And the answer is tons. So here's uh, low, medium, and, and high. So this person, these mice have tons and tons of high level of C. diff colonization, treated with cefepirazone, streptomycin, and or vancomycin. So five days is absolutely enough to wipe out your microbiome and cause overgrowth of, of C. diff. Five days. Moving on. How about healthy volunteers given one dose of, in this case, Cifterolin Mevobactam? And so here we have uh, healthy volunteers, Bifido, Lacto, Clostridia, and Bacteroides. Um, and the answer is, because it doesn't treat Bacteroides, almost immediately. So we almost immediately in humans, when we give an antibiotic, cause enough destruction of microbiota to start getting. C. diff colonization, one day. Everyone got that? One day gives enough disruption your microbiome to cause increased risk of C. diff. Okay, so a very short course of antibiotics enough to disrupt your microbiome, but you should push back on me. If you are listening to those firmicutes, you go, dude, you can't kill firmicutes with antibiotics, they're spores. So the only way to do that would be those firmicutes have to start metabolizing and turning themselves into vegetative cells so that we can then kill them with our cefepine. That's the only way that could do that. And then you go back to my little cool microbiome system biology slide, and then you'd have to go into metabolomics because that must show increase in metabolism, right? And so now we're back to Vince Young again and, and Anna Erber. So he's got this really sweet model where he gives mice again he calls it this R1, R2, where you're completely resistant to getting C. diff. Uh, and if you just sample this mouse again after a number of weeks, you still can't get it. You have to give antibiotics. That's all this is trying to show. But then after you give cefepirazone, you're in the susceptible stage that sticks around you and get C. diff whenever you want to until you get back to this resistance stage. So the question is, is there anything different in this stage compared to these other stages where we can't get C. diff, then you go over to here and this S1 here or the S1 here, wherever you see red, that indicates up metabolism. So that's just saying to you there's tons and tons and tons of metabolism happening, happening at this stage, aka your spore firmicutes are germinating, causing them to be able to be killed by C. diff. Let me move over to Eric Pamer, who's a sweet dude. So th this is then his. This is not actually my theory, but it's his. So antibiotic, antibiotic wipe out the vegetarian bacteroidetes. Then firmicutes pick up that space that we've now wiped out from the bacteroidetes. They then germinate, and then we can wipe them out. That, that's essentially his, and I like that theory quite a bit. And then from there, we start building a lot of cool stuff. Like we defensins and regulins, and we change our bile salts, and we change our short fatty acids, we start producing some food that we didn't produce before, aka all those proteins that are being made create stuff that these new bugs can eat. Now remember, we still are generally, because there's only one or two days, plowing in the cefepine, because it's more than a day. So what's going to grow back in this place where there's some awesome food, well it's going to be your MDRO proteobacteria. Isn't that cool? So series multi-drug resistant pseudomonas, or my bug of the day, C. diff. We are just essentially letting them feast on all this food that the bacteroidetes used to take care of and letting them overgrow. And so that overgrowth in this case can be C. diff, but when you say, where the heck did that CRE come from? Most likely from the exact same pathogenesis. Okay, so any antibiotic that kills firmicutes or bacteroides will almost immediately increase C. diff risk. Got it. Thus, the most common antibiotics with these properties should be the ones that are high-risk antibiotics. 
And then that's pretty easy to do. Uh, you just go to your Sanford guide, Dear Sanford, which of these antibiotics kill Firmicutes, which of them kill Bacteroides, and which of them get in the gut. And once you get going, you can make your laundry list pretty easy. And then you say to yourself, well, how common are these used in our hospitals? And then that would be your one-two punch you need in order to get to your high-risk antibiotics. Now, every single one of us had wished clindamycin was the only antibiotic because we never use clindamycin. And therefore, I couldn't care less if I get rid of that from the formulary. But boo-hoo for all of us, that will not work because we don't use any. Therefore, it's not going to be a big risk factor for C. diff. Whatever we use a lot of and look at what it is, ah, crap, it's carbapenems. Shoot, I can't get rid of carbapenems, ultimately, because I need it for my patients at risk for everything else. So we have to then live in this world where all the stuff we are using is exactly the same stuff that's going to cause C. diff, and that's why this panel is going to be totally sweet. So I'm gonna charge them, I, you cannot pick your favorite drug to get rid of. You have to get rid of overall consumption. And then these guys can tell us how to do it. So that's gonna to be totally sweet when we get there. Now, just in case you think I'm completely lying to you, I'll present maybe the best PGY1 residency mm -hmm. project of the year, Megan Davis. Kat was her preceptor and I helped her a little bit. Uh, and I'm super biased because this is the only one I was involved with this year. So that's why I'm vouching it as the number one. So Megan and Kat, Will, and a guy named um, Harlan Sparrow, who's an IT super special systems analyst. So Harlan, I'll say specifically, could get every single admission at the Methodist, like every single one, and, and could code them whether or not they, they were in there for more than 48 hours. And that's been done before, but that's still pretty sweet, tens of thousands of patients. And almost 100,000. And then he was able to, in the Methodist Link system, go back into a previous admission and get antibiotic use, which is completely unique. And then we did some kind of smoothing around to make sure they didn't go to other hospitals. But he can then look at the past hospitalization antibiotic use and the current hospitalization antibiotic use and look at C. diff prediction. Really sweet. And so then you can say, what are the high risk antibiotics, et cetera, et cetera. And so here they are. Uh, controlling for age, PPI use, and Charleston comorbidity index, which is just a measure of how underlying sick you are. Uh, here's your laundry list. Ampicillin, cefepine, ceftriaxone, ortopenem, imipenem, meropenem, and pictazo. And also look, that there's really none that stands out like as really the one. It, they're all just increasing risk. And then also pay attention, this is just a yes-no variable. It's did you get it or not? And we all spend a ton of time saying is there a big change after you've had X amount of use? And the answer is no, which is exactly what those mouse models and the single healthy dose long years would have suggested. You go from nothing to risk, which you guys are now going, again, crap, because I can't stop them after seven days or 14 days or just pick the people with only 30 days. This is a risk that goes from zero, approximately 0% 0 to about 2% from day zero to day one, and then maintains. Isn't that amazing? So then, here's what she did, essentially, is she, you, can, you can stratify this stuff. So did you receive a high-risk antibiotic, one of those ones in the laundry list, yes or no? And then we can stratify by how comorbid you are, not at all, just a little bit or more than that. I received a PPI or not, yes or no? And so if you can go all the way down to a risk of 0.14%, uh, so super low, all the way up to a 6% risk. Baseline risk is about 1% if you just took every all comer set. So, you, so a six-fold increase or about a six-fold decrease, depending on that. For those of you guys who are paying attention, let's see if we can do this here. A PPI use negligible increase, actually no increase at all, it actually went down, and then no increase at all right here, it actually went down again. Ooh, that's different, isn't it? Like P and, but then give somebody a high-risk antibiotic with a PPI, whoa, a doubling of risk. Whoa, a doubling of risk. Whoa, an almost doubling of risk. Very consistent. So a novel finding of this that needs to be explored is, what is the relationship between PPI use, at least in this data set, which is 100,000 patients, well-executed design, only if someone is on a high-risk antibiotic 
does PPIs increase your risk of C. diff, which leads a lot to stewardship interventions, I think. Okay, so this is Rob, Rob Owens, who many of you know. Um, he has still the best review article, it has to be repeated. This is from 2008. So this was his money shot. But we can actually now just go bing, who, where would we think would be the most high risk antibiotics that we use? Carbapenems, third and fourth generation of cephalosporins, amox, and a clab would be next, and piptazone. This would be your, really your 2018, I'll, I'll say it. We're getting close enough, 2017, 20 uptake on the antibiotics that are the most likely to cause C. diff in our hospitals today. Yeah, okay, good. So from that, I want to replace Father Time with Usain Bolt and, and recognize that this is not a, a slow event at all, that this is an ubiquitous organism. Once you give an antibiotic, a person is immediately at risk, immediately like run in the 100 yard dash. And so if you can change your father time image into a Usain Bolt image, that would be then now your contemporary knowledge of what, of what risk for C. diff is. Okay, so now stewardship intervention time. Which of these stewardship interventions are most likely going to help you decrease your C. diff rates? And you can start really thinking about it better. So that antibiotic timeout the earlier you can do it is obviously going to be the better it is for you. Now you can put some thought around, well, maybe if I stop it after three days or even five days, it'll restore it faster. And that would be research, but that's in my mind a really good thought. So I, I still think antibiotic timeout would be a great, great way to do it. Rapid diagnostics are great, but they're even better if they can prevent you from starting that empiric therapy in the first place. AKA they don't exist in the moment. But that's where we gotta get to to really wipe out C. diff and potentially MDR organism in the first place. IV to PO conversions, no, they'll have no, no demonstra demonstra demonstrated effect on C. diff. And especially if they're a little bit non-absorbable, you might actually be increasing your, your C. diff risk because you're killing more gut microflora. Formulary restriction, probably the best. And anything that slows down carbapenem use in my mind would be a good thing. Uh, if you looked at this and you just kind of did a laundry list of everything that's ever been done to prevent C. diff, it is amazing how actually positive influence you can have on C. diff rates, usually by restrictive use of whatever your most commonly used high-risk antibiotics were. But the, the, you get dramatic reductions from, this is per 10,000 patient days, 15.8 <laughs> to 1.9, 5.3 to 2.3, you can read down from there. There's obviously a publication bias here. If, if you tried and it sucked, you're probably not gonna publish it. You just, if, you, if you tried and it worked dramatically well, you likely are gonna publish it. But you do have a lot of data supporting if you really go after changing your antibiotic use, I think it's a good idea to put C. diff rates on your laundry list of things that you're gonna measure. Because uh, it, it, it very consistently works. It's hard to find a negative study, but just remember that there's probably a bias in that too. You did something magical back there last time. This is a really good slide, but let's, let's look at it in a second or two. Give me a, give me a fast forward, there we go, good. And then if you combine it with a bundle, it's even better. So a lot of people will go after hand washing as a, as a big one. Hand washing plus your stewardship, that'd be the most likely bundled stuff you do. Not a bad idea. Um, probably stop the PPI would be second, and then tailored therapy against C. diff would be number four thing that most people most commonly do, and you get good reductions when you, when you're, when you uh, bundle it up too. I wanna finish off on this, and I'm actually in really good time, so I'll have plenty of time for the panel to discuss too. Uh, what you're hopefully getting from that is, crap, we're never going to really be able to prevent that dysbiosis. Because in today's world, we can't stop empiric therapy. And now I've brainwashed all you guys that after that one or two doses that we're never ever going to be able to stop, you have enough to cause C. diff. Shoot. So now you quickly are going to get into the world of, so I want to pharmacologically or microbiolo microbiological alter the dysbiosis, aka you're going to be in love with fecal microbiome transplantation very, very quickly. But then you quickly think that's disgusting. I want something else to do. And that's going to get you to probiotics. And you're going to really wish you had a probiotic that would work. And so I want to, I want to finish off on something we have and then what's coming down the line that um, 
that, that we might be able to use. I'm not going to mention this, but you should actually uh, just copy and paste this. There's a beta-lactamase, non-absorbable beta-lactamase. You pop the beta-lactamase while you're infusing the beta-lactam. So then when the beta-lactam gets into your gut and is floating around killing your microbiota, you have this lovely little beta-lactamase that's chewing that up. That's totally sweet. They talk about a cool way to prevent dysbiosis. But now you have a little bit of translocation problem and this non-absorbable beta-lactamase goes into your systemic bloodstream and now the bugs you're trying to kill, are getting, the drug is getting chewed up by this beta-lactamase. So they're gonna have some serious problems getting through phase three because they have some serious safety issues on their hand. But this is what we're trying to do to prevent the dysbiosis. Super cool stuff. So I'm not gonna mention it other than that, but you should look it up, it's a neat product. So, th so this is Johan Bakken, and he's arguably the world's most famous fecal microbiota transplantation ID guy. He's done probably a thousand, he's in Minnesota. And so everybody goes up to Minnesota for their FMT. And so he's got this laundry list of a lot of patients that can't qualify for an FMT, almost always because of that, they can't afford it. Still costs about $3,000 to do it. So he's got this laundry list of people over here that he can't get done, and he's got a huge laundry list of people that he has done. So he said, well, gosh darn, I hate to leave these guys just sitting around doing nothing, so why don't I give them a probiotic? And then he did a little, little look around, he bumped into Kefir, which is that, that probiotic milky drink that you can buy at, at, at Kroger's or whatever you want, it's usually in the health food section. So it's got a super high CFU count, and it's got tons of different species in there, mainly lactobacillus, but tons of other stuff too. So remember I said CFU and diversity is, is what you think about in the world of microbiome. This is like the packaged FMP. Pretty neat, eh? And so this is um, $2 a bottle, and I have no conflict of interest. I'm a big fan of kefir. So he then said, well, while these guys are waiting for an FMT, why don't I just give them 15 weeks of kefir right here, a little shot three times a day, while I'm uh, pulse dosing Vanco or Metronidazole. And in these super chronic C. diff patients that would qualify for an FMT, he had response rates just as good as his FMT population. So, so, so if you're in love with dysbiosis and you want to prevent it, and you say to yourself, crap, I don't have an FMT unit around, like the FMT unit might be just in Kroger's. <laughs> and so it gets a really sweet little interventions. And so right now, like, and you'll be doing it pretty soon, when we are discharge counseling C. diff patients, hey, you going to Kroger on your way home? Like, we think that's a sweet intervention. It's nutritional value. I've never found any toxicity. So why don't I drink some kefir? And then they say yes or no and go from there. But I, it's a great intervention. And that's why I like kefir so much, as opposed to bio-K, which I also think is pretty good. Okay, so and then we can take it one step further. So this is Dale Girding. As many of you know, the, the, the C. diff toxins exist, the toxins A and B they live in this huge cassette called the pathogenicity locus, called PALOC. And so for many C. diff strains, they're not non-toxigenic. You essentially don't have the PALOC. So you have this lovely C. diff organism that can't cause disease. So why not swallow this non-toxigenic C. diff before you get toxigenic C. diff this non-tox C. diff would grow in the places that C. diff toxigenic would normally reside, and you could prevent it in the first place. And so this is what Dale Herding did in a phase two, and once he got the dose right, he was really able to prevent recurrence really, really nicely in this phase two study. Phase two company went broke and bankrupt, so he's currently shopping around for a phase three. So if you've got anyone out there that has 500 millions to blow, this would be a sweet little phase, this would be a sweet little phase three to run because it's got a sweet, sweet ending. Uh, Serial 109 didn't do quite as good, but it's the serious health. Uh, this was find the world's most healthy poop. This was this is their this is this is their story. It's sweet. A thousand people were screened. Uh, you can't have a dental cavity, you can't have any history of anything bad happening before 55, you probably have to be Usain Bolt. So you are Usain Bolt and you donate tons and tons and tons of stool. And then these super scientists weed out the feces and come up with all the firmicutes, the spore formants that are in that stool, and they package it into a capsule. And then they employ that Usain Bolt guy for a few years to make a whole bunch of capsules. And now they've actually got the fermentation tanks doing it for them. They, they, so it's the homemade fecal microbiome transplantation. So they had a wonderful phase too. Um, CR109 times two days 
absolutely wiped out uh, the chance of recurrence. It was totally, totally awesome. They went into a larger phase two, which was an absolutely dismal failure for unknown reasons. They're blaming the PCR diagnostics. They're wondering if Vanco was on too long. So it's not prime time yet. And they're still trying to understand why that didn't work. We have this data to suggest that it works, but it's probably going to be a little more complicated than the simplest swallowing a poop pill. But, but this is the future. And, and this is now and or two years from now. Uh, this is just from the, the same phase two study, but this, so this is the, back to diversity again, this is a PCA plot it's called. Here's our healthy microbiome right here, all this blue stuff. This is what we look like. And so consider blue good in this particular case. And these are the patients, all this red stuff is uh, patients before they had this serious pill. And if you're really, really far away from blue, that means really, really bad, uh, just to interpret it that way. And then yellow and orange is after they've had this series pill. And you can see these guys all good, got pushed back to good after they swallowed this pill. In other words, they really had an altered microbiome, which made them look a lot more normal after giving, giving it. So the, the science behind this was really sweet. Not bad, I said 45, I was 46, and you gave me an introduction for one minute. So I think I'm right on time, this is fantastic. Okay, so I, I think after this, you are, no one in the room's ever gonna say clindamycin's the big culprit again. That would be what I'd want you to come home with. No one's gonna say, let's stop clinda and we've solved the seizure problem. If you were really paying attention to those slides, you would notice that quinolones were way down the list. Even though they drove the last epidemic, there's some controversy around that. But you're going to say, quinolones, no. You're gonna go after cefepime, ceftriaxone, Zosin, and in our world, you're going to be looking at miropenem, imipenem, or depenem, whatever penem you use these days. Those are the high-risk antibiotics. You are now going to say, I'm really jazzed about my stewardship programs that can protect the firmicutes and protect the bacteroidetes. That would be something new. You weren't probably saying at 4 p.m., you my guess. And you're then saying, boy, I'm really into this dysbiosis thing, and I, I, I dig some probiotics that might work. Um, some studies that look at changes of, of microbiome over time. Those would be the three take-home messages from today. Thanks to everybody. So Jahangir is right here, sitting on my head, as you can tell. He, he's a he's a he's a, micro, a microbiologist. If you ever want to know what, what what bugs are containing in rocks, he's your man. He can find bugs anywhere. So when I quote the shoe stuff, that's him. His his wife Krishita is a microbiologist. She's awesome. Um, here are my fellow and my new fellow who's not up here yet. I got to take that picture and the whole gang. So uh, thanks for all your contributions. I will leave it at this really sweet picture to, to finish with. I, I'm told I have to take two questions or, or I don't get the uh, free wine at the end of this. <laughs> so I, I need two questions from the audience, please, and then we'll bring the panel up for a sort of more formal, uh, informal discussion. So I, before I leave, now there are one or two questions from the audience. Uh, fire away Bobby Jean to begin with. So did you say that any <laughs> Not only any kefir, but I mean, so if you find it that a little tart, uh, put a teaspoon of honey in, and just, it's beautiful. <laughs> and I've beta tested that on a few people, and, um, they, and it, it, it's great. And it's all super anecdotal, but just because you mentioned I got to tell a story. So my dad is a chronic burper. He burps like crazy. And if you look in a chronic burping, it's a microbiome problem. And I put him on kefir, and guess what? I'm the favorite son. Uh, I, I'm the only son, uh, but, uh, but it, it's gone. I, I've got, uh, I've got a half dozen C. diff. I've got uh, women just with IBS, and that doesn't work as well in my anecdotal experience. But it's just amazing that I think it does influence the microbiome. So if you can find the right sweet spot, it works. And that's totally anecdotal, by the way. And then, Andrew, I think you were also going to hand up. Unless you had a capture question. <laughs> so in the slide that you had a couple of slides back, where you're talking about stewardship interventions to decrease C. diff. Uh, I think another thing is that you can probably talk about this as well is like the, the community incidence of C. diff. So people having C. diff before they ever hit the, the hospital doors. Is that something that, that, that we see uh, increasing in our patient population? And, and, and May not be able to yeah, I totally agree with you. And so as, as most of you know, and you especially, a lot of that comes without pre-existing antibiotic use. And you always say to yourself, I bet you there's missed antibiotics. 
Like, I'm sure they, they swallow their friends' pills or something like that. But as you see enough of this stuff, you, you truly believe some people. But no, I, I really does. I thought it was food poisoning. Like they really haven't had antibiotics before. And my guess is it's absolutely a genetic risk. That some people are just more predisposed to the inflammatory response caused by that C. diff, probably because of maybe changing microbiome, which could be genetic related, or just host differences in inflammatory response. And I, I think that's what we're seeing in that particular area um, would be my guess. One more, Harlan, is that you back there? So I'm not sure if you're familiar with a study, I believe her primary author was Sarah Dornberg, where they looked at tetracycline, which was a low risk antibody, cetraxone, a high risk antibody. And of course, they did see more C. diff cases with cetraxone. But surprisingly, when they were taken together, it was a lower C. diff. And if that's correct, yeah, she's that was an awesome study. That's San Francisco, and she's um, she's actually chief of infection control there too. That's her job. And I've been trying forever for the tetracycline companies to help me with that one. Um, they don't disrupt microbiota, the tetracycline, as much as anything else. But in that particular study, it was ceftriaxone plus that, so you still have the disruption in the microbiome. So how could then this well-executed quasi-experimental study? that when they did it before and after, the addition of that tetracycline instead of, I think it was azithromycin, changed that much. So you'd think maybe there's some pharmacological activity of, of tetracyclines either against C. diff to kill it, or maybe to prevent the toxins, would be my guess, as an like anti-metabolic activity. That's my best guess. $100,000 will answer that question for anybody interested. <laughs> Small intestine, it has an extremely slow release time. It, yeah. And every now and then, C. diff is susceptible to tetracyclines and not always, but in, in San Francisco at that time, it could be. I agree. So it's very slow Yeah. And usually it's given in reduced amounts. Good point. Yep. There you go. I don't need the 100,000 anymore. We're all set. I don't need the 100,000 anymore. Well, okay, sure. <laughs> Oh, thanks for all for your attention. Let's, I don't want to hog the lecturing because we've got some sweet questions coming up. So can I get the, the panel to come and sit at your appropriate spot? We'll see if anybody blew this off and isn't coming. <laughs> Frank, what's happening? Okay. Well, actually, I can talk to you too. So let me let me let me quickly introduce you guys while you're getting settled in. Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Perfect. We didn't do it in order. So the the next hour format is a, I have a series of six questions. Where I'm only allowing these guys ten minutes per question, and I'm cutting them off after that. So we it should be somewhat rapid fire and it should be fun. So. A lot of you know everybody, but so Andrew Hunter, a stewardship pharmacist stud at the VA, uh, Kat Press, a uh, stud at the um, Houston Methodist. Mayor, first time I met you, nice to meet you, by the way. And I'm going to mask your last name. So, uh, Mayor, nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you um, at Baylor Sandwich Medical Center, uh, Chief of Infection Control and Stewardship Physician, which is totally sweet. So, great to have you. Uh, Frank, I will also mask your, your last name, uh, Stewardship Stud at MD Anderson Cancer Center. A David at Memorial Herman, Edgar Rios, who I think controls HCA, right? So, so, he, so at the end is sort of a lot of our systems guys. So Frank, uh, David controls Memorial Herman system, Edgar controls HCA system, and, and, and Catherine controls Cardinal Health Systems. So car, system guys, health system guys, this way. A lot, a lot of the questions are gonna be based off what can we do individually, what can we do system-wide, which is why we have a, a totally sweet panel here. Okay, so thank you guys for showing up. You all get a glass of wine on me after this is done, and as much cheese tray as you'd like. This is your contribution today, as is mine. Okay, so I got a, a series of six questions. I have shown them there before, so they've been able to prepare their thoughts a little bit on it. And so let's get started. If we need to decrease, okay, this is, this is then the premise of my talk. If we need to decrease total antibiotic use, 
to decrease resistance and C. diff rates, what is the best way to do this? I think we can start with. And Kat, since you and I did that project today, let me, let me get you to start with your thoughts and that should get things going. So what's the best way to lower total antibiotic consumption? So, well, I was really hoping that when we started this project that we were going to find the holy grail 72 hour line in the sand that was going to tell us, okay, if you stop X and Y antibiotic at this point, guess what? Your C. diff rates go down. But that's exactly the opposite of what we found. Um, so it has to be overall consumption of antibiotics. And I think that probably going after patients who don't need to be on antibiotics is likely going to be the best way to address this just because we focus a lot on patients who have infections and on tailoring and optimizing their therapy. But I don't know that we spend enough time really looking at all of the other patients that are getting antibiotics a day or two willy-nilly for really no good reason. And so maybe figuring out how to kind of educate those physicians from even starting an antibiotic and maybe you know reducing urine culture and asymptomatic bacteria and all of those efforts um, is one way to kind of change the mindset from stopping antibiotics early to not starting them at all. Catherine, you want to pipe in from the community, far, community hospital level? Yeah, I think I would agree. I think asymptomatic bacteria is probably one of the biggest ones that we as pharmacists probably can address from a global perspective for sure, but um, Changing urine culture practices, I think I've seen a big impact on that in some of our hospitals, just reducing overall cotty rates, but also being able to, excuse me, stop antibiotics from even being started because we don't get the culture in a patient that doesn't need it from the reflex pan culture. So I think those strategies definitely, in collaboration with infection control and MIT physicians, can be really successful from what we see. Andrew, from uh, you would say though, screw you everybody, just make them not, not be able to prescribe it, right? Why, why not just have a super ultra restrictive formula, right? Well, because that, I mean, having a very restrictive formula can have some adverse effects as well. So you don't want, I mean, in patients that have true infection, you don't want to delay infection because their condition of And so I think that's something that probably all of us run up against when we have this kind of dichotomy of wanting to provide uh, appropriate therapy as soon as possible, but wanting to prevent unnecessary antibiotic use. So I think like, one way potentially to help decrease the, the total antibiotic use is really to just do like, more education about like which patients actually truly warrant antibiotics and, and, and like which patients potentially can you wait and do more diagnostic workup um, that are not critically ill and you can basically hold off giving antibiotics until more diagnostic, more um, you know, physical antibiotics can be taken on. Yeah, good. Have you guys ever seen data that says support a super restrictive formulary has lower overall use? Is that true, or that's just what we perceive to be true? Mayor, have you seen it? Or so I um, read an article a few months ago in each infection control hospital epidemiology. They uh, they randomized uh, wards in one hospital into restricted versus um, audit and prospective feedback. And they found that the uh, wars that they got the uh, retrospective review, um, or like they talked with the physicians every day, and it's like, okay, you maybe you should adjust your antibiotic. They would uh, led to decrease in total antibiotic use more than uh, the antibiotic stage. The problem with it, it will need to have a robust stewardship team where we'll be able to review antibiotic for everyone in mm -hmm. the hospital. And that would be a challenge probably for all our stewardship team where we can't review like, all of it. Right now, probably each one of us would focus on uh, some indication on some low hanging fruit, but going to every patient is going to take a uh, big team and big support from the hospital. Thank you. You're the old man on the panel, including me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think, you know, when you're looking at total overall antibiotic use, when they're talking about hospital immediate care, hospitals here, you know, 500 plus beds, or even some of the community hospitals in the greater Houston area, 300 plus beds. I mean, it's difficult to say that the dedicated stewardship team, one stewardship pharmacist and physician, is going to see every patient on antibiotics and really impact that. So you have to have systematic approaches to 
empower the prescribers to make the best decisions. So I think you know, education, I know it's not as effective as a lot of other strategies as a you know quick turnaround, but I think you know education is a big key component. Um, we've seen success when we've uh, really done uh, you know kind of uh, hard driven educational campaigns at some of our hospitals um, to bring awareness to the providers and then to have some systematic approaches to try to identify patients who are low risk for infections and and bring that bring that to the forefront of the providers so they can see that um, make it you know make it uh, information available at, at the time of prescribing um, to help identify those low risk patients um, you know they want the provider want to do the right thing I think a lot of the pres prescribing of antibiotics is out of fear um, and so if we can help bring forward some, some data to help alleviate some of that and, and identify low risk patients. Um, I think that's what we can make as an overall kind of total antibiotic consumption okay. approach. I mean, a lot of times the stewardship program, you have a restriction policy on certain antibiotics. When you're only targeting a, a certain class or, or one antibiotic, you know, a couple of antibiotics, but you're not looking at the overall. Yeah, exactly right. So, and, and Frank, last word, uh, the weirdest of the weird and the in unstoppables at MD Anderson, is there any way to, uh, interfere with that antibiotic usage? Well, I mean, I think, you know, all these different, if you take each one of these modalities in, in isolation, be, um, you're never realistically going to get 100% compliance with it, uh, or it's not going to be the, you know, the one thing you need to do that's going to solve your problem. So I think a kind of a multifaceted approach is necessary, and with the idea that you can't expect, again, 100% compliance. So. That's kind of what we've what we've tried to do is um, you know we have a program where we aim at decreasing the duration of therapy through kind of a mass alerting. Um, we've seen like a, a decrease in in, dur in mean duration of therapy in that manner. And in an individual patient, it may only be one day, but when you kind of put that across the whole institution, you get a, a drop in consumption. Um, the same thing with kind of upfront uh, restriction. It only goes so far because once you get a patient that that uh, qualifies for that drug. Well, now someone now now that patient kind of got through the gate, and now the patient's on the drug, and if there's no follow up, they may stay on that drug, you know, for many days. So, you know, in, in a prolonged unnecessary duration. So I think you kind of need to you kind of need to to hit it from a bunch of different angles, and not expect that you know any one of those things is going to carry the carry your program. I think I just again when you look at you know you're looking at C diff rates in a particular hospital. It, just covered you know, some nice information that shows that different antibiotics are associated with different risks, but I think it's also a function of the volume of use at that hospital. So you may have a low risk antibiotic, but if it's a high use antibiotic at your hospital, that's probably what's impacting the most significant at your hospital. So it has to be individualized. Um, and a lot of times, operational things such as um, if you use order sets or, or electronic order, uh, order sets or those kind of things, what is built into those order sets? A lot of times, drives what positions we use. And so we're looking at those operational things as well, you know, the, the simple things as removing certain antibiotics from, um, you know, from, from being easily orderable in the electronic system or however you do it. That's great. So I think we'll be, it looks like we'll be about, unless these guys really get warmed up, which they might, we will probably be six to eight minutes to kind of get individual thoughts out, which gives us a few minutes to get questions from the crowd and burning and opinions. Because actually there's a lot of crew in here that are, equally qualified to be sitting up here with us too. So um, as we get into these questions, start thinking about your own reflections and, and, and your own thought points on this as well, and or any things you want to pimp with these guys out and see what they say, which also be fun. So, um, okay. I have one other final um, recommendation, which is based on our data from our project this year. What I'd like to do is when you're trying to order an antibiotic, I'd really love it if you could get a flash up of if you start this antibiotic, your risk of CJ is going to increase by X amount. Yeah. <laughs> like just right off the bat, I think that would really be some of the things and maybe uh, you know. Yeah, it's not. It's not. Just, it's not all benefit, yeah, and no, right. and no risk. There's there's risk Absolutely. with that benefit. Yeah, I like that. Actually, not this question, Kat, but some somewhere's in here. Interject what you're going to do with your time out stuff starting. Okay. I think that would interest anybody too. Yeah. Okay, that took us uh, nine minutes and fifty four seconds. Well done. We stop my timer. Cancel. Okay, uh, David and Kate, or Catherine, uh, not Kat, but Catherine. Yeah, I'd like you guys to uh, moderate this session too. So pimp, pimp the crowd out and get some, some, some guys in the crowd to answer too. All right, here's the question. 
What should be best practices to coordinate stewardship at the health system level? So think C-suite health system in this particular case. Or for you guys too, how do I get interventions across multiple hospitals? And I think everybody here has systems that they're responsible for. It just so happens I, I, I pimped you three out to, to really be the systems guys, but I think you can draw on everybody's experience with this too. So take it away, stewardship at the system level. <laughs> well, um, if I think I think the best way is is just coordination um, and and how to be in relation with so many different with different individual facilities and practitioners. Now the challenge there comes as your system becomes larger and larger, and divisions are centralized more. Then uh, there's there's disconnect. A lot of times that decisions are being made at corporate or systems that aren't being disseminated to individual facilities, or decisions are being made um, that are supposed to be uniform when there's a diversity of, of different hospitals and facilities that have their own specific needs and demands. So how I mean it's it's gonna be challenging regardless, but how um, I think it is best done is to have a good number of representatives from each facility and have people who have ownership of it in each facility that will take it back and have some flexibility to tailor it to their different organizations because um, one size sometimes cannot be wrong. And do you have coordinated meetings? Like how, at a systems level, how do you coordinate stewards? Do you have a chief Puba systems person and 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 individual hospital level people, or how does how does it work? Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, well, I know you raise your hand from Herman. That's like yeah, half the room. <laughs> half the room. <laughs> we're we're still trying to figure it out. Is kind of my inter um, interpretation of the current state. We do have uh, people who are who are responsible for it from a system level, and we, I believe, at this point, have a pharmacist in every facility, right? Yeah, so, so we have congratulations. And, 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 thank you. And here we, we have, I think, um, a physician from the facility as well. So we're we're getting there. Um, the challenge is uh, our end time infectious, or infectious diseases. Um, decisions aren't necessarily strictly just made through this citizen view, through this antimicrobial stewardship system committee, right? So there's many other specialty committees that sometimes things come out of them and it, it's been implemented not for a couple of months, all of a sudden we hear it, it came from system. <laughs> um, this, and you call system, no one knows who the system is. So it, it's when, when you get to as large as, as we are, there's so many different um, decision makers. It, it's there's what we've struggled with, at least um, I've struggled with, and others can comment, is identifying <coughs> when decisions are being made, when they're being made, who's in how there's the expectation is to be implemented at, at, each, at each hospital. Thanks. And maybe if going from David, and not to cut you off, but just to move on to Catherine for a second. Going from a hospital, going from a pharmacist in every hospital to a pharmacist in every in one in maybe hundred hospitals. And maybe you could chime in what David's saying, and then how do you change? When and maybe describe your job just very briefly, like the corporate level oversight, which is different than sort of David's boots on the ground still job that, that then has also oversight. Yeah. So I used to have a job like David before, and now now I'm more of like a consultant. Um, Cardinal side. So we have over 200 pharmacy managed hospitals where we either um, manage, like, we either hire or basically have hired director of pharmacy and or general manager and or the entire pharmacy staff. So we may have various resources at different hospitals. Uh, we have anywhere from critical access up towards 800 bed community hospitals, very large spectrum. I would say from our system level, uh, the coordination is very different because we're not on a 12 hospital system like it was before, but I think that getting the information out has been huge too. 
We have done separate little work groups that I think have helped a lot. So our critical access hospitals, we set up a work group to kind of work through the different phases of stewardship. Um, we have LTACs associated with and rehabs associated with our pharmacy managed hospitals as well. So a lot of what we're developing are the resources and tools for people to implement. Um, I think one of the challenges we run into, and I think in a 12 hospital system I ran into as well, are the resources that are available. Um, we have anywhere from a staff pharmacist that's never done anything but entered orders and made any clinical interventions ever in their life to, you know, some places that have specialized pharmacists and or ID physicians. So I think um, myself as being one of the resources that they may contact for specific interventions. Um, I would say one of our biggest challenges, one of the additional biggest challenge is with all the new regulatory requirements, hospitals that may not have ever done stewardship are coming like, our main target is going to be to decrease C. diff, which is an awesome target, but I think everybody in this room knows that that's not one intervention, you know, success you're going to see after that one piece. So I think being able to, what we've done is break it up into sort of four phases of stewardship to have it roll out to all of these different hospitals with regards to regulatory requirements, some of the foundational aspects and how they're going to build those pieces. Empiric, um, making sure empiric recommendations are appropriate. So I know we talked a lot about restriction versus prospective audit. A lot of our hospitals do not have the resources for prospective audit or, you know, in my opinion, that shouldn't be the first target of their, how are we going to develop a, a stewardship program? I think, you know, Edgar really hit on a, a, a big piece that I think is important. When we talk about restriction, to me, it sounds like policing. I love an hate restriction because I think it can be very effective if it's rolled out the right way. And we do have what I like to call criteria for use, not restriction criteria. Um, and I think the communication is going to be huge with the physicians, getting the key players on boards within the different, basically how we do in any hospital is kind of identifying those key players and who we need to build, bring into the conversation to make them part of the decision and not just the policing. So I, I do um, agree with you that maybe education hasn't been shown alone as an effective strategy, but I think when you can combine that with criteria for use and follow up with the pharmacist, it's a very um, effective strategy. So those, that's been really what we've seen is very effective is, is sort of bringing in the expert when it's needed either to talk to IV physicians, special specialty groups to help drive home you know we're not just going to talk about neuropenem restriction but let's talk about sepsis and what your hospital susceptibilities are and sort of not just targeting restriction alone but targeting the whole disease state maybe to really work on that instead of just one drug alone and you're probably like you you're, you're kind of boots on the ground but you're sort of at the decision table of hca a lot of times you kind of have two hats almost anything to add to uh what's been said yeah, I think, you know, from a health system level. So I'm, you know, a lot of a lot around antimicrobial stewardship has to do with behavioral change and changing prescribing practices, right? And that can be very different from hospital to hospital. The issues, the dynamics, the personalities are different. So it has to be, if you look at all of the you know, IDSA stewardship guidelines, they always say, here's some general strategies, but you have to tailor it and customize it to your facility, right? Because there, there's always nuances and differences. So I think from a health system level, you know, what, what we found is leveraging our information IT technology to uh, build, to put in clinical decision support criteria into uh, ordering of antibiotics or those kind of things that are more systematic and, um, um, and, and help providers make the best decisions at the point of order yeah, entry yeah. versus you know, trying to address it on the back end. So um, it's just a, a few examples would be um, I, you know, the newer uh, joint commission and criteria around, you know, requiring antibiotic indication and duration on all antibiotic orders. I mean, that's a simple, it sounds like a simple thing. We know it's not a simple thing in a lot of electronic health systems right now, you know, they don't even, you know, never require that information before. So it, those kind of things, um, you know, that's something that we're building now and are, are close to implementing at, at uh, all of our hospitals. So I think simple things like that that can help. From a health system level. And pairing that with like treatment pathways for the hospital with the guidelines. Cool. I mean, Kat, maybe I'll finish with you. I, I sat in on your monthly um, stewardship teleconference series when Megan was presenting your data, and everyone kind of called in and 
I find that kind of effective. One kind of say what they were doing and that can maybe describe that and what you, what you think about it and is that a good way to keep the troops rallied and all that kind of stuff? To date, um, it, 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 I think it has been. So we are a seven hospital system now and I think we focused quite a bit on really advertising and selling stewardship. We made a big fuss. We told everybody that there was a system stewardship committee. But we did it in a way that really kind of set that as a venue for decision making. And that was the intention. We really wanted to make sure that everybody knew that there was a place where these things were going to get discussed. And we've essentially worked out a calendar where you know we have these monthly meetings and every other month we'll have a couple of hospitals present you know, a status update on their stewardship programs. And that's been really effective because it's really helped to keep everyone kind of accountable. And it's not asking for, you know, a crazy slide deck or anything. It's just asking them really the leap broad survey questions, the NHSN stuff, you know, how would you address this today? And then we use the other opposite months to really look at, you know, system-wide guidelines and protocols. And, um, and it's been pretty effective uh, so far. I mean, we've been, officially doing it for about, you know, seven months now. Um, but it's, it's interesting though, because I do, I get the sense from the community hospitals that, you know, hey, you know, I'm bringing something to system stewardship next month. And so it's starting to kind of catch on that, that, there, that this, this is a thing. And it's not just antibiotics, you know, here and there, it's if you're gonna have antibiotics on your order sets or in your treatment guideline or on your pathway that, you know, there's a group and we'll take that work off your plate and we'll take care of it. And that's kind of how we've sold it is why don't we help you instead of, you know, we want to police what you're doing. Mm. And so it's, it's been, it's been a good, a positive experience so far. Some of the other pharmacists may disagree. Who knows? My, my, <laughs> here, here, though. <laughs> the enemy in the crowd. my third party observation there, just as a newcomer, it wasn't big hospital driving little hospital either. It was like everybody demonstrating their best practices and then open conversation, good or bad of that. So good. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, Mayor and Edgar, if you guys would take the lead on, on this one, please. Uh, how do we synergize our interactions between stewardship and infection control? And I actually want to add something on to this question and nursing. If you, could, if you could address that issue too. How do we synergize our interaction between stewardship and infection control and nursing? Mayor, you're the new kid on the block. Do you want to get, get us started? Okay. So, I mean, uh, like in my position, Scott, I've been working both with infection prevention and also with uh, stewardship. So, I found that there is uh, a lot of venues that uh, working with um, like uh, two groups help each other. So obviously the biggest one is CEDA, where we definitely can't decrease our CEDA number if we have high use of antibiotics. So we'll have to uh, decrease our total antibiotic use. And also the um, uh, stewardship can also work in other issues like, for example, probiotics, looking at uh, PPI and H2 blockers, um, looking at uh, limiting ordering CDIP in people on lactulose or flu softener. So there is different stewardship intervention can happen to decrease CDIP. Um, in terms of uh, CLAPSI uh, for uh, central line associated with immune infection, uh, there is also, uh, we're working with pharmacists now on having antibiotic block uh, for patients with um, uh, long-term hemodialysis catheter and that will definitely need pharmacy intervention. There are few trials which show that giving uh, antibiotic clock will not only be good for treatment, but also for prevention of class. Um, in terms of surgical site infection, that's also a big one. Um, so we, have, we need to um, work on the uh, order sets for different surgeries to have like, what is the appropriate antibiotic? And there was lots of research recently, like when should you uh, get MRSA therapy for the cetazolam? When should you target uh, gram negative, depending on like, how many organisms you see? What's the optimal dose, what's the optimal duration? I get lots of help from Anna and Katie with like the antibiotic redosing. So if we have a long surgery and getting this antibiotic, what time should we redose it? It's something uh, I don't know without the help. 
Um, <clears throat> in terms of um, hardware, it's also an area that we can both work together. Our goal is limiting parties we, uh, by one of the things we can do is uh, optimizing when people should order urine culture. And that's not only will help us with parties, but also will help us with increasing antibiotic use for asymptomatic uh, bacteria. Uh, one of the uh, other things we're working on is in terms of pneumonia. So working with vaccinations uh, in terms of uh, what would be um, like optimal influenza vaccination this year, what should you do in terms of you have egg allergy. And the new thing is what about pneumonia vaccination? Uh, how, uh, now we have the new guidelines which uh, uh, the uh, conjugated vaccine should be given before you are given polysaccharide. Most facilities are giving polysaccharides. So we're trying to switch to uh, conjugated vaccine at the hospital to decrease our pneumonia rates. Recently, we have started um, um, rapid diagnostic methods. So that's also a new venue for collaboration between stewardship and infection control. Um, so one of the things is with these diagnostic methods is we get quick time to get right antibiotics. Uh, but, uh, also, but also it will help them in terms of quick time to get MRSA bacteria. That's something that we report and it's important for us to have those patients on isolation. And it will help us getting, uh, if we, for example, doing the IPCR, no virus. But those patients need to be in isolation. However, there might be some challenges is when you get the results as like a scan in an electronic health system. So this is an area where we can work with pharmacists and with the uh, EHR people. So in order to get the data to infection control. Um, the other thing is obviously there's regulatory infection prevention uh, is part of the uh, antibiotic stewardship. And um, the other thing is logistics in terms of working together. Like, for example, our hospital pharmacy don't have access to like data mining system. So we're using our infection control to help them. It, unfortunately, it's not as accurate because you don't get uh, actual usage prescription, but you will get like over prescription using uh, like our, uh, our, uh, our culture system. So those are like some areas that we can work together. In terms of nursing, nursing are an integral part of our infection uh, control uh, committee. Uh, we work with them in terms of um, clubs, you hardly see that every single uh, subcommittee we have nursing sitting on it. I do think they, um, we can, uh, there is room for improvement in terms of more collaboration between nursing and antibiotic stewardship. For the most part, it's been the physician who uh, sits on the antibiotic stewardship uh, committee, but I do think there are some area for improvement, especially with the C diff and uh, for copy, for example, like uh, not ordering urine culture or uh, not ordering C diff testing. So I think this is uh, for sure important. Okay, okay. Anchor, uh, fill in the blanks on that one. So I think how to synergize interactions between stewardship and infection control. I'd like to kind of rephrase the question there. How to synergize interaction between stewardship and quality because um, oh, I think what we've taken is, you know, we at least within our hospitals is, is um, you know, collaborating with our quality colleagues uh, to really, you know, change stewardship in the mindset of, um, unfortunately, you know, in the past stewardship has always been seen as a pharmacy initiative or the cost saving initiative or, the, you know, you want to restrict my expensive antibiotics initiative. Um, and it's not really been promoted or seen as the way it should be. It's a quality initiative. It's intended to improve patient quality, quality of care. And so what we've done is we've required that, um, you know, in the past we'd say our stewardship team should include infection control and blah, 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 and all these other people. But how many of those people really show up uh, to help out and show up to meetings or really be engaged with the program? Usually they say, oh yeah, I, I support stewardship, but what are you doing really to support the program, right? So. Uh, we require that all of our uh, at all of our hospitals that uh, there be a quality designee uh, designated for the steward for the stewardship program. They have to attend the meetings, um, and at least that's a start. Um, and 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 second is all of our hospitals have to uh, define goals, specific goals around their stewardship program, not just I want to decrease antibiotic use. But what give me some specifics and how are you going to measure it? Um, and and that has to be. And that is incorporated into the quality uh, department's goals. So now uh, they are invested in the stewardship program. Um, 
and, and it just it, it changes the focus from a from a pharmacy you know to a quality uh, the way it should be. Um, infection control and how they can synergize with the stewardship program. Um, I think at the end of the day we have the same goals. Our day to day responsibilities are different, and I think a lot of times you know we 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 think about well we should we invite infection control to our to our meetings or to our uh, you know to be a part of the stewardship program. But do we give them any practical things that they can do on a day-to-day -day basis to really help us with stewardship. Um, so I think that's where we fall short a lot of times. You know, the, 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 the stewardship or the infection control practitioners say, yeah, I support stewardship. I come to your meetings, but I sit there and I don't really have anything to contribute or I don't feel like I have anything to contribute. Um, or what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis to help you, right? Um, so I think we need, to identify, we need to get more practical, everyday kind of strategies that they can do. Um, just some examples, I guess, would be um, you know, for example, uh, you know, screening patients for, 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 you know, screening patients for colon, for colonization for the multi drug resistant organisms, most commonly like MRSA and DRE. Um, how can we use that information from infection control to identify those patients who are negative for colonization? And can that be used to help the stewardship program maybe de escalate or, or, uh, or, or streamline some of their antibiotics? I know mean, there's some pretty good data on. MRSA uh, uh, nasal uh, uh, testing is showing that if that's negative, that has a pretty good negative predictive value for MRSA pneumonia. So identifying those patients who are unnecessarily on vancomycin for pneumonia, um, and can we get that stopped? Um, same goes for, you know, maybe for VRE. Um, if you identify patients who are colonized with VRE, you know, kind of from an infection control standpoint, they identify patients who are infected with these multi-drug resistant organisms. Are they getting that information over to the stewardship team to say, hey, these are patients who are colonized with these resistant organisms. Can you evaluate them to make sure that, number one, they're not being unnecessarily treated if it's only colonization, or if it is true infection, then you know, make sure that they're being the most appropriate therapy. Um, so I think it has to be a little bit more, you know, we have to think of in their daily workflow and try not to disturb, to disrupt their work. You know, everybody, it's really, you know, you, you intrude introduce a lot of disruption to their workflow, you, you know, you're causing problems. Yeah, true. So you need to think about how you can implement practical strategies that are not going to disrupt their workflow on a day-to-day -day basis. Be the first one we did for 10 minutes, that's great. Mm -hmm. That's job, that's perfect. Nursing, I think it's a lot of the selection <coughs> strategies, you know, unnecessarily collecting urine cultures, a lot of, a lot of times nurses want to do the right thing. They take the initiative to say, oh, this patient had a fever, I'm going to culture a urine because they have a foldy, but you know, was that necessary? So a lot of education I think needs to be done on Yeah. Well, with like no pay for no performance or pay for no performance, I think infection control is getting more and more powerful. Like a lot of the power is coming into you guys. It's sweet. It's yeah, good I, I know that the stewardship would, would fall next. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's like uh, infection control has lots of sticks because of now it's moved to right. treatment. Yeah. If stewardship has the same thing, then yeah. that And all of a sudden ID Theradoc. Okay, you can have Theradoc. It's as getting as simple as that these days. Yeah. yeah. So let's do one more can question. Then everyone start thinking of questions. I wouldn't. I want to pimp these guys out more. We're not. We're not challenging them, these guys. So everyone think of a question to pimp these guys, and we'll give them four minutes to, to, to spit something else. See if it's see if it's at all rational or not. So as we go through our next question, to digest what they're saying, but also start thinking of stuff you want to you, you want to ask them. Problems in your own hospitals primarily, and or just big picture topics too. So let's do one more can question, and then we'll finish off with like four or five of these more rapid fire cool stuff. So what's the best of the next three? Andrew, you're, you got the best one. Let's, let's, let's continue on, because like, how you do this is incredible. Okay, Andrew, you're on this one, and then this may be like a two second talk. So think fast. Uh, how do you maintain strict formulary control in the VA, Andrew? And how would we ever do it in the non-VA setting? Before you get started, I, I gotta give Debbie Goff a, a, a throw out. It's not restricted antibiotics, it's protected antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to protect your High risk antibiotics. So, how do we get to formulary restriction to formulary protection? Please, Dr. Hunter, tell us how to do this. Sure. So, so, like Catherine and I think Edgar mentioned, you know, a lot of antibiotic use is um, predicated on kind of habit and uh, what they observe other clinicians at their site do. And so, I think part of the reason why we've been successful in restricting or protecting antibiotics in the VA <laughs> is just because you know I came into a scenario where where I had inherited a program where there was already restriction in place. That was the culture. And so 
people knew that they had to call for Fibonacci and such things, those kind of things like that. But I think the, the next step is, is, you know, I hear all the time of the new interns, they say, well, I, I heard I have to call you. Um, so so they, they, in their mind, they're thinking of it as like an extra step when, when, when the education and the, the culture change needs to be like, I need to call you to justify why I'm going to need to use this because I understand you know, the big price and, and stuff of being, and these are very broad agents. So I think that's the piece that's missing. Um, and that's what our job is, is to just to try to teach them, like, this is why we're uh, restricting or protecting this antibiotic. It's not because we want to be um, very, you know, uh, intrusive in the practice of these physicians. It's basically to try to protect patients and get the most benefit out of these antibiotics. So, so in a like third party observation, VA is like a yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. So no problem. You're not going to give me DAPTO. I'm okay if you I give me Vanco. But the Wild West that the rest of us live in, yes. screw you. You're getting DAPTO. Like th that's the third party observation. Yeah. Well, I'm not saying that we're 100% perfect. I think we're going to agree. That's that there is no perfect stewardship program and things fall through the cracks. I mean, um, you know, the restriction program that we, we, that we run is predominantly, you know, Monday through Friday, you know, when, when I or my residents are around and we can basically staff these collections that come from our clinicians. We really run more of like a uh, kind of a hybrid, like uh, prospective auditing feedback and, you know, pre-authorization program because, um, you know, I don't think anybody has ID pharmacist support 24 seven. Um, people were in the all times of the night. So there is some element of prospective audit and feedback. And, and when you're doing these interventions, you're calling and talking to providers. I think how you make those recommendations and how you speak to them um, helps you to get buy-in so they're not just uh, aggressively saying that, you know, you know, screw you, I'm gonna go ahead and use this anyway. <laughs> um, so, so making your case, making sure that you have a clear plan, making sure you provide them with alternatives or if you, if you are, in the course of the discussion, you say, well, you have some information that may warrant use of this antibiotic, but provide them with, with uh, timelines or, or mile markers they have to meet. So, so you can have the vancomycin for 48 hours, but once that book culture is negative at 48 hours, you're going to stop it. Uh, I think setting those things um, helps to create like a, a program where you're not viewed as the antibiotic release. Okay, cool. okay rest of the crew. Futuristic question. Uh, I want a world where anti-infectives are treated exactly the same as oncologic agents. That <laughs> no way am I giving cisplatin, me, and no way are you giving septin, whatever. How do we get there? Frank, you're up, because you know both of us. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that we, we try to um, with all of our new, pretty much all the new drugs that have come to market are essentially restricted into criteria in our hospitals. So like in the last couple of years, pretty much most of the new antibiotics. Um, whereas before it was just kind of a free for all. Um, so one of the things that worked work really well for us is like, when it comes to these newer drugs, a lot of, a lot of people that are not ID aren't gonna really know how to use them, where their place is, um, or you know, they're so focused on their own specialties, they may not have a chance to really uh, understand what's going on with the drug. So I think, what we've been successful with is getting our ID people together in a room before they see the patient or they're at the bedside and kind of talking about where is this place in therapy, how do we want to use this drug, and coming up with that, that, sort, of, um, that sort of paradigm of like, okay, this is how we're going to use the drug in this institution, we're going to use it in these scenarios, and then set it up like that as kind of um, criteria for use rather than the restriction. Uh, and then what we, what we see is that whatever ID does when they come in consult, they're kind of they're kind of teaching by example, um, and so I think we've been pretty successful in, in rolling things out in that manner, where we have these criteria for use. If there's no problem getting a drug when you need it, and in those scenarios, and it also kind of prevents our individual kind of more cavalier ID people from just saying, "Well, I want to use it in this patient," because then they have to answer back to this whole group that, as a group, you all you all sat in a room and decided on this, right? So, um, so that that's been that's been pretty successful for us. Now, trying to go back and take all the other drugs and come up with criteria for use that kind of gets out of the bag. Um, that that's a whole other challenge, I think. That that 
you know, I don't have the answer to, but. Mm, they'll become so resistant that we'll never use them anyways. Yeah. So we're set there. I feel like one of the big things a lot of our hospitals focus on is the dollar amount, because all the new drugs are expensive. Yeah. And so I think, even though it's probably very simple, and you probably don't know to do this, but it's not even talking about the cost until somebody asks, focusing on the reasons, like you're saying, why we want to reserve this agent and not, this is super expensive and we're going to spend a ton of money on it, but it's not that it's super expensive, it's that these are options for these types of patients and that's all they have. You know, so I think changing the mindset of stewardship, where I think originally a lot of people said, oh, we can save money with it, is focusing more on the quality. Good. Yeah. I think, the, and also, I mean, you, you have to catch up with all the diagnostics because the way oncology works the way it does because you have all these markers <coughs> and targeted drugs too, right? So, but we're, we're kind of shooting in the dark all the time, you know, and I think that's where the, where the um, diagnostics really come into play to getting, getting at, you know, for antibiotics to be more like a college agents, they have to be more directed and they have to have those tests that, that bolster that, you know, kind of approach. And actually, I, the cat, you're kind of attached to it at the hip of a Malditoff, and then you control it. And I wonder if that's all of us, like we'll all be attached to bear gene or whatever, or T2, whatever we're attached to. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And then we'll, we'll be more reactionary to diagnostic tests. Maybe that could cure. I, I love it. I love the diversity of opinion. I love, the, I love what, what you guys bring to the table. Sweet. Okay, um, Ivan, if nobody asks a question, you have to ask the first question. You ready for this? <laughs> so get Ivan off the hook here, everybody. <laughs> so what, do you, what, what questions do you have for these guys? Um, what's, what's the burning stuff that, that you would want to hear? I have a question. You, know, you have this uh, thing about antibiotics and everything like uh, chemo. And just think about it. I have a dream. Yeah. 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 I have a dream. You know, the emergency room setting, for instance, like there's all these uh, – mandates now about getting antibiotics in quickly if you suspect sepsis or pneumonia uh, and ERs are judged and hospitals are judged as far as how quickly you get the antibiotics in and you see that even before culture is drawn. So uh, I don't know in your study where you were looking at when it, if you looked at the patients that were admitted when antibiotics were started but I would assume a lot of it is started in the emergency room probably because of these mandates, and they're there because they save lives. So at the same time that we're trying to not use so much antibiotics, there's a huge push in medical education, uh, actually in hospitals, to use them pretty quickly. Yeah, and don't consult a super specialist before you get going. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a major conflict. I <laughs> mean, it's, you know, I sit on sepsis committee, and you know the number one question that they have for the antimicrobial stewardship team is, how are we doing with our antibiotic turnaround time metric? You know, they, it's not about stopping the antibiotics or which antibiotics. It's about how quickly can we start the antibiotic. And so it's, it's definitely a different perspective. But um, I think that we're on one hand we need to look for the opportunities where we can we can keep them from starting. So in patients who are already admitted, so in, you know, you're starting at very symptomatic bacteria. So those kinds of disease states. And then in our other, um, in, the, in those patients with sepsis and poor measure and needing all of those things, it's all about the antibiotic timeout. I mean, we have really, really, really focused hard on that. And our sepsis team has thankfully been extremely receptive and has actually been very supportive of, of trying to, I mean, they were the first group that said, oh, we want to pilot the antibiotic timeout on our order set. I was shocked, but I mean, I was like, great, <laughs> it's fantastic. And because they know that, that they are throwing the kitchen sink, and so they want there to be a fail safe or some other kind of second review at some point to really say, do these need to be so? And I think that that's all we can do, right? I was really hoping that, like I said, we were going to have a three-day mark. It was all going to be awesome. But that doesn't exist. So um, I think we just have to stick to that antibiotic timeout type of mentality and really reassess at the appropriate, you know, 72 hours and see if we can stop the antibiotics. What I'd like is to have a like a stop date, but I know that gets controversial. Next week. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. 
I was gonna say, I think, I think that's where also the clinical decision support has a role. Um, so, you know, we know patients are gonna be needing to start on antimicrobials quickly. So trying to figure out ways to leverage the new kind of uh, electronic health records to, um, to help people choose the right antibiotics, to choose, you know, the more directed antibiotics towards the, whatever kind of symptomatology they have, or, or even just the idea that, um, you know, a lot of times the kind of, the, the starting of really broad spectrum antimicrobials is just because what, what if, right? Well, if, if you have a really good system where you can quickly look back and see, has that patient had antibiotics before? Have they had any kind of resistant organisms in, that, that you can find you know, within the health system? If you can find that really quickly, you're a lot more, probably a lot more, um, you know, comfortable, you know, treat, treating with a little bit less broad of an agent. Then, you, then if you don't know any of that information, you're just going to probably have to default to, the, to more broad. So I think th those sort of things, while they're not going to solve all the issues, you will kind of see, you kind of start to, to chip away at that unnecessary use that started up front, you know, really broadly. And I can add one thing to that. So when, when I didn't show, so when, the risk almost happens instantaneously. This virus happens, you see their risk goes up. But as you add on another class of drugs, that does increase your risk again. So maybe you can't stop that first one in the ED, but by gosh, I'm going to stop the second one. And that would also help C. diff. I will add to that. Kill the PPI. Yeah, yeah, and kill the PPI at the same time. All right, good. We didn't mention it, but one of the things that I think we come across a lot on the large system level is the lack of uh, coordination between the microbiology lab and the either stewardship committee or pharmacist. They have a lot of labs that are out there, micro labs, are not updating their information even when the new panels come out. So they are still using 64 as a susceptibility breakpoint for pit takes. So I think there's a lot of opportunity in both directions, either overhauling CRD because they're looking at any kind of, you know, different factors like that where there's a lot of opportunity to drive practice to narrow or spectrum therapies when you're optimally selecting your panels too. Good. Question number one goes to you. Thank you. Gold medal. Uh, other questions? Other scenarios to debate? Take them. Let's say that the microbiology lab, the EHR, and rapid diagnostics actually did talk to each other so well that you achieved this future dream that you want. What would be the next step beyond that? Perfect coordination amongst healthcare. That's a mighty task, by the way. But once, yeah, but once, yeah, can we get, to, can we get to the state where we're only treating definitive diagnoses? Well, I think the next step is to make sure people are acting on the information just there. Because just because the information is there doesn't necessarily mean that clinicians are going to react to it. Um, so I think that's been shown in short. The, hum the human right. model can I, mean, I think that we, we're at a point where if we were to be able to coordinate all of those things seamlessly, we'd probably be doing whole genome sequencing of everything, and we would have all this real-time sequencing data. but. I don't know that people would know what to do with it. And so I think along the same lines of reacting is educating and learning ourselves. I mean, our micro lab can sometimes give me some really crazy club CL or very cool business. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> well, we're just gonna treat that like a club. Off we go. And off we go. <laughs> and I think the data that goes into the EHR or what comes out of micro or even how it's reported in bracket is only as good as the person that's inputting it. So I think you know the education piece is still really important as a whole for, for how we're rolling these things out because I think from what I've seen a lot of the programs um, that some of our hospitals have had lacks kind of the, the meat behind it to be meaningful information that's coming out to the provider. I mean, uh, one of the things that micro is like good about is like you would tell you like this is the organism, and but then even if you got this, you're like, what is this organism? So you might have to help with like some education. One of the things that we're doing with rapid diagnostic with the biofire is that the microbiology would call the physician within two hours once they get the result. But then we also having a uh, the pharmacy would call the physician and it's like, okay, you got this bug. Maybe you should switch the environment to this. So just having the data enough might not be enough. So you need to give them uh, education. It, it's better to be like uh, education at this part, not just like the later few days. 
can, can I dovetail a little bit on what Kat said? So taking the next step, you know, a lot of what we've done in uh, the diagnostics in the microbe lab is looking at, for example, like genes associated with antibiotic resistance. So that's looking at a microbial genotype. We haven't even cracked the nutshell of microbial genotype with clinical outcomes and genotype. So looking at, can you find the presence of genes or big variants, expression levels that are associated with either better or worse outcomes in the patients can you pick? You know, if it's a cephalus of pathogen and cephalus, so which one do you pick? Is there, is there a difference or not? Can you identify the bugs that even though they're susceptible, they're associated with worse outcomes? Can you identify the ones that are resistant, but are going to be really dense? And that's, you know, the clinical outcomes, there's really not very little if there's in that one. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and the host obviously plays such a big role in in all of it, and so yeah. just knowing what makes that host, what makes the basilin a better agent in that host with that bug is just it's mind blowing. But it's, it's well, I think awesome. I think along those lines, like one of the things working a lot of uh, immunocompromised patients is that um, from my previous job, I worked in a more general hospital. And it's it's <coughs> so you you see a lot of times. The way that organisms or pathogens manifest is a lot different. So, uh, C. diff is a great example. Uh, in a patient that is non neutropenic and, and pretty, uh, pretty normal immune system, they, they can have kind of a raging disease where oh, we see a more attenuated disease kind of in the more immunocompromised patients. And so, I think that's the other, that's kind of once we get beyond just trying to kill everything that's causing the problem, is, is trying to look at all those post responses. And the responses to the toxins and the toxin mediation um, and all those sort of things, because that's really what's killing the patient. Like in sepsis, it's really kind of the patient killing you know the, themselves while trying to get rid of this organism, not the E. coli you know going around um, uh, eating up their organs or something. So um, I think that's kind of the next the next level of getting at getting all those things. In my pet peeve, that's called mild to moderate disease in stem yeah. cells. No, it's not, and so I would change that too. I agree. Okay, if you have a pending publication for potential use of novel echinocandins um, in, in, in the near future, you have to ask the next question. If you are that person, please raise your hand. Oh, we have someone in the room with that. I can't believe it. Artif, could you ask the next question, please? Everybody's kind of looking at rolling out all this information, what the commission is going to want, and how we're all going to meet these standards. So I'm interested in hearing what component of the standard, what are you worried about? What do you feel like in your hospital or your system that you feel like is a gap, and how are you addressing it? Um, from our hospital, I think uh, uh, we, one of the things is we're working on improving is like patient education. Uh, so that's one of the things that we cannot see on me, but we're hoping that we uh, make some changes. So the other thing is to mention that the antibiotic uh, duration. So we already have an antibiotic indication in EPIC, but uh, the duration is something that we didn't have, so we're working on having this. So we do we meet lots of the other requirements, but those are the other stuff. What, what are you doing for patients? That's a daunting task to get everybody educated up. What, what are you doing for patient education? Uh, we are like thinking about those like uh, posters from the CDC about antibiotic use, other ideas we have like from um, hospital discharge, maybe see if something about antibiotic use and we're like, the question is how general or specific you want to go with antibiotic yeah. use. And the, that's going to involve like nurses and pharmacists on this logo. So the easiest thing is be a little bit general about antibiotic to get the check mark. Yeah. But if you want to do it right, then you will have to more work for the nurses yeah. and the pharmacists. For the Any other examples? What else are you guys doing for the patient education piece of the Joint Commission side? We're, Go ahead, Catherine. We're, um, we're, quite, we're having our hospitals uh, put it in a discharge packet, which we know is an ideal kind of what you're saying. <laughs> um, we also have had a preliminary um, Joint Commission survey, and obviously they weren't looking at the time, but they were asking about where do you have it documented that the patient received the education? So including something like a check mark, like you're talking about, because that's a yeah. um, similar like work for an education, get the check. So that's that's been our approach and it seems to you know fulfill some parts of our system. We 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 made our own, customized our own one page, you know, little brochure that goes actually in the admin 
packet, not the discharge packet. Um, uh, and it includes not you know just kind of overall general what is antibiotic resistance? Why why would we use antibiotics? Why do we not want to use antibiotics if we don't have to? And then it talks about how you can prevent getting infections while in the hospital, like what you can do, you know, make That's sure you're healthcare back, make sure your nurses, your physician, whoever washes their hands before they come and examine you, those kind of things. And um, so when antibiotics are not indicated, you know, just some very general things. Um, and we put that in the in the Admission packet, not the discharge packet. Okay. Ivan, before I pimp at any of my other residents and fellows, do you want to you know, get a question? I actually did have a question regarding the information you presented. Um, you talked a lot about the broad spectrum antibiotics, um, the impact broad spectrum antibiotics in terms of how they contribute to or can contribute to C. diff. But I don't recall any, any data on how it could, well, how C. diff could be brought on. By some of your more limited antibiotics, such as your Dapil, such as your Vanco, was there any association you made with those antibiotics? Don, a question to me. That's awesome. <laughs> well yeah, done. I was just curious because uh, those programs are, yeah. you know, especially when it's a lot of good use. I know Dapil now being a generic is starting to bump up as well. So I just, I was just curious uh, about the, 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 the grand positive antibiotics and so many of the broad spectrum antibiotics. Best question yet, because it was a C. diff one. That's awesome. So in, in these databases, IV VANC is always tagged to a high-risk antibiotic. But you immediately blow that off, because IV VANC is always tagged cephalene, dose, and neuropenem. You don't give VANC, you give VANC plus whatever the high-risk antibiotic. So you kind of always throw that away. But all these gram-positive agents are sweet killers of Firmicutes. Uh, they're awesome. With the problem, they're all gigantic molecules that don't get into the colon very well. So it's this weird interplay of they're always tagged to another high-risk antibiotic. They also don't get into an uninflamed colon very well. But if they did, they would kill Firmicutes like there's no tomorrow, better than Cefepine or any of these other guys that, are, that were giving it. So if I put that all together, they are probably medium risk. And when you add them on to a high risk that kicks the crap out of the bacteroidetes, kills the Firmicutes a little bit. I bet you there is an additive effect, but most likely not to the same extent as the, the truly broad spectrum. So from an FDA standpoint, is there any, is there any talk or any directive in terms of citing the risk of C. diff in a PI? Um, I don't know how many people would actually take attention to it, but it's in every single PI where, you know, where there's an antibiotic, but should there now be additional information speaking to that and as well speaking to PBIs being added to an antibiotic increasing that potential. Right, sweet. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be great, Kat? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I so here's here's my new pack of labels. I'll pu I'll push it to you guys. I think we should consider dysbiosis as a major adverse event of antibiotics. It's not some weird scientific anomaly, but it should go into the packet insert, low, moderate, or high level event of dysbiosis. Can I get that done please? Or is, is, is it possible? Sure. Maybe. It's possible. All right. Well, close. It's one of those things I'm telling you. As soon as you enter the order, yeah. your risk. Okay. <laughs> Just why not? We got time for one more. I'm going to pimp another one. If you have been a fellow, <laughs> uh, infectious diseases fellow, for five days or less, <laughs> you and only you may answer this we may ask the last question of the day. Uh, is that person available? Oh, Ann, good. Okay, you got, you got the floor. Take it, take it away. Um, okay, so I noticed we talked a lot about new patient stewardship, um, understandably. But obviously, I think we all know that a lot of the antibiotics we outpatient are really more unnecessary more often. So I was kind of curious to get y'all's input and see how many of y'all's stewardship programs incorporate an outpatient component, whether that be in the ER, outpatient clinics, you know, in a discharge review, anything like that. So we've actually, um, we have a, we, that is a whole separate stewardship program, like branch that we have. Um, it, and it's actually, we're doing it because there's like a meaningful use measure with the Texas Medical Foundation, something where it's like one of the programs that we're participating in for, some sort of metric that's attached to dollar signs that I'm not really. Yeah, you know, sounds <laughs> But um, 
so we, we have a medical director who's really, really interested in stewardship on the education <coughs> side. And it's, it, I mean, they have a lot of really interesting perspectives and things that they're doing, like measure, like they're totally taking advantage of the delayed um, scripts um, upon just uh, whenever their patients leave the office and they'll just leave them on record and then they can go back and see and, and really look at that metric of how often they got filled and how often they were even released, how often the patient actually called back or sent them a message on the my pit, on the chart thing on Epic and all that stuff. And it's actually pretty slick. Like I looked back at their data and I was like, wow, this is pretty comprehensive information. But again, it's, it's part of this kind of bigger project that they have going on, um, but they are actually all signing statements that say that they're committed to, um, you know, only prescribing antibiotics when they're necessary and that they'll weigh the risks and those things and they're putting it up in their office. Um, so it's, it's actually pretty encouraging. It's kind of, kind of cool. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Other, uh... Programs, big fat nothing. Uh, we've had a couple of hospitals that have been interested in doing it, but the problem is, I don't, as with I think inpatient stewardship in some of the smaller hospitals, I don't think anybody wants to front a resource to actually support that. So yeah. a lot of them aren't attached of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Except for it like that. Um, so that I think has been a big struggle. ED, I think, is a little bit easier, obviously, because it's attached to the hospital. So I think kind of. Honestly, I think the ED physicians I've worked with have been the easiest physicians to ever work with. They love they love the information when it's specific to them, when they can be engaged. And that's probably not going to be every hospital, but um, so I do think that, and you know, obviously there's been data out there with, with the ER, but the outpatient realm is a whole other beast. I think. And Andrew, nothing to the VA or yeah, a little so, bit. So I think everybody agrees that like outpatient stewardship is like antimicrobial stewardship's iceberg. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> we know that it's like we can see, we can see in patients, we know that it's a real location is under the water. So what we're trying to do at the VA is, is I think the first thing is basically trying to describe antibiotic use uh, at, in, in these outpatient clinics. And so um, we're part of a, a group of hospitals in our, in our kind of local VA visit where we've actually been able to generate like an outpatient utilization report looking at all of the, the antibiotics that are prescribed in those settings. And basically we've been getting this report now for a couple of months, basically trying to first describe our, our problems. And then I think we, we, we're working on a thesis project with one of our residents um, to basically try to initially tackle chloroquinolone prescribing. So, so outside of the realm of C. diff, you know, we, we are seeing uh, decreasing susceptibility to E. coli and Klebsiella to chloroquinolones. I think this is a major um, risk for our patient population just because they're predominantly geriatric, so there's lots of side effects with those medications. And so what we were planning to do with this project is basically uh, use this utilization data and actually send it out to the prescribers and basically quantify you know, who are our kind of um, high, high prescribers and basically do chart review on their patients um, and then potentially do uh, not only email notifications saying, hey, you're one of the top you know, 10 prescribers of uh, Cipro in our health system, but then also meeting with them on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis so we can actually do uh, case review, chart review, discussion with them about the prescribing practices. Public shaming, essentially, which is good. Always, always works. A mixture of, a mixture of uh, not so public shaming and, <laughs> yeah. and then public shaming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I would just, just to add to that, we're, so that data that you know we've been able to get from Epic and whatnot, it's very similar. They'll tie it to a diagnosis code and all that, and they'll they'll feed it back to the provider. But it's very much still in the this is what it looks like phase. It's not any like nobody has taken the, the steps to go in and actually review those charts and stuff. And frankly, I think it would be very difficult to do so from our perspective because I mean. Going back and retrospectively reviewing an inpatient chart can have a ton of bias in and of itself. A clinic note? Oh, good. Yeah, good point. Great. Good point. Good great. Great. Whoa. Well, actually, so 6 and 6 30, we did, we did a good job. So, uh, cocktail hour started at 6. I'm starting at the shakes because I need my glass of wine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, thanks to Susan. I think she's in the back room. So, Susan Thomason for organizing this event. Please come to the next one. She's an unbelievably good organizer. I thank you to the esteemed panel here today. Your wisdom is unbelievably awesome. Nice job. So, and thank you all for attending. Let's hit the bar and uh, have a drink or two. Thanks.